So I want to start basically at the beginning and talk about um, how I entered the district. When you're a new superintendent, you're advised to develop um, what's called an entry plan, which is anywhere from the first 90 days to the first 66 um, months of really digging in deep and understanding the context of Georgetown Public Schools. My focus for my entry plan was on listening, learning, and understanding. And the three targets I really wanted to understand deeply was student, staff, and community experience, what is it like and the, my engagement in the process of interviewing and meeting with people, and then really the organizational cap capacity, which is to synthesize the current strengths and resources of the district, including um, teaching, curriculum, assessment, student learning, and everything that goes along with it. So I did that until probably, um, I don't know, I was very lucky because Carol Jacobs allowed me to come to the district for May and June before I started in July. And between one and two afternoons a week for those two months, I was able to come in and really be at her side and have multiple conversations, which really helped me start and have much better context just joining. Um, if you want to read my entry plan findings, you can find them on the website. I presented them uh, to the school committee, I think, the first week in July. So um, I asked a lot of questions, but I really wanted to hear teacher and community voice and student voice and really understand what their experience has been. So I asked anybody that came and met with me from the community the same questions that I asked staff in when I did a protocol at the school. And that was, what are things that you'd like to see um, started in Georgetown Public Schools? What are some things you'd like to see continue that's great and super proud of and want to keep growing? And what are some things that you want to um, see stopped? So the community experience really emphasized the pride in the town and they really appreciate the small town feel and that the teachers know and care deeply about our kids. The community would like to see technology improve and see more inclusive practices and updated curriculum and stronger professional development. The committee, um, the community was frustrated. Um, their frustration lies with their, in their perspective, with limited accountability of staff and students and they would like to change from the status quo, including honestly how the school committee meetings run and what happens in the classrooms. Staff experience, staff, it came out so loud how proud and appreciative they were, they are about the work of the whole student, which really means not just thinking about a student academically, but their social emotional needs, their health needs, their family needs. They um, appreciate the technology they have, but, and would like more and they appreciate the support of administration. Like the parents, teachers would like to see updated curriculum, more technology, and more student accountability. They would also like improved communication between school, central office, and additional resources to strengthen the tier, multi-tiered system of support. Teachers shared that their frustration lie with ineffective professional development, lack of strategic trajectory, and inconsistent systems and student accountability. The student experience, students had um, shared similar alignment with staff and parents regarding their confusion on inconsistencies with discipline and behavior expectations. They also, real, rather surprisingly, or at least it surprised me, they expressed discomfort and not understanding sometimes staff's use of humor, specifically around sarcasm. Across the district, most students feel success. They feel that teachers treat them with respect and that schools want them to succeed and teachers are here to help. On another note, fewer students like school, believe peers treat each other with respect and students misbehave in class. Through my process, I engaged with a multitude of stakeholders and many themes emerged. One thing that I heard and then witnessed myself time and time again, how unbelievably hardworking and dedicated our teachers are and how much they care about our students. I am in the classrooms and I can tell you, I see 
I mean, unbelievable amount of work. I, I don't think I've ever seen a teacher sitting behind their desk. I'm multitasking, being aware of the whole context of what's happening in their classrooms and still being able to focus on a, on a, you know, a, a minute in time with an individual student. Safety, our partnership with the police and fire is really strong and it supports that staff and students are safe in our buildings. Um, I noticed that there is concern around special education, that many family members express concern regarding our special education programming. There is a significant concern around our decline in enrollment, especially at the secondary level, and how can we keep students in our district. Overarching significant worries around the school budget and how we can sustain ourselves financially over time. Concern around outdated curriculum, resources, and insufficient data tools and insufficient technology. And another huge piece of pride is a very strong symbiotic relationship and partnerships between the school district and the community, like the PTA, GAA, GYCC, and, and, and many others. And when I said, talked about this before, I didn't mention CPAC, and CPAC was in the room, and they're like, well, what about CPAC? I consider CPAC part of us, not a partnership. So maybe I, you know, we have a really strong relationship with CPAC as well. And um, the last piece of the puzzle was to really understand the district capacity. And I reviewed a significant amount of information, data, and I'm just gonna share, a, like just honestly, just a tidbit. And if you want more information, the entry plan is pretty thorough. Um, the, just when you think about our accountability data, the district exceeded the state set targets for our graduation rate and for the number of students and how they're participating in our advanced coursework. Um, we have seen a decline in our enrollment since 2016. We are, to this year, we're down 205 students. When you have a district of about 1,200 kids, 205 is a lot. Um, the schools were funded three out of the last eight years as requested by the school committee and the superintendent. So the school committee and the superintendent put ahead, put together budgets that had a higher ask than, uh, than the town gave the school department, except for three years. Um, and we have a little bit of a declining in the accountability data, resulting in the high school slipping to the 47th percentile in the state, the middle schools at the 45th, and Pembroke's at the 61st. So... Um, so again, you all of this information is available. Happy to talk through with anybody if they want more information. You can just reach out and schedule an appointment with me. Um, and the reason I think it's important, so you guys, I'm so not doing my slideshow. Um, so the reason I think it's important to tell you where we began was because when it came to building the vision of school, it was absolutely nestled in all of the information that was gathered over you know, the first six to eight months of my superintendency. And it was all done with um, partnership with school level administrators to really think about um, how can we take the amazing foundation of the work that we have and the people we have and be able to, to improve what's happening for our students and, and their academic and social emotional outcomes. It can go, I can't say it enough, how every conversation I have with parents, every conversation I have with children, how much they adore our teachers, how much they feel valued and cared about. So I think, I mean, that is, that is the beginning of all the work that we need to do. We also heard, you know, feelings, honestly, of desperation from teachers and from community around needing new curriculum, updated technology, including data systems, software, and devices. Um, and everybody unanimously says they want to move the district forward. So none of this is in question about wanting to improve outcomes for students, wanting better resources. Um, and after several hours of meeting with our principals, we ended up with the model of school that exists, which really is about creating small learning communities, increasing time on learning. Right now, our average class size at our secondary, I mean, our average class um, time in our secondary schools is 43 minutes. 
which is um, a very short amount of time when you think of kids transitioning in and transitioning out of the classroom. So how do we create a model of school and a, a schedule that actually increases time on learning without it impacting the school day, which then impacts the budget because of asking teachers to work longer would be a financial impact. Um, we need to prioritize the learning, the new curriculum. So for example, when we're bringing in a new elementary ELA curriculum, there is really strong expectations and recommendations on how long the learning block for ELA will be in our elementary class. So that's gonna shift what the students experience during the day. Um, and we need to prioritize staff meeting time that's embedded to support curriculum implementation and deeper understanding of the whole child and really help modernize teaching practices. And I personally believe that this needs to be done during the school day. We just can't ask more and, and expect teachers to give additional time um, when it should be part of the school day. So the goals are identified on this slide, but I wanna point out that when we think about a, a creating a small learning environment, the crux of that is how do we support our teachers? So if you think about the secondary model, when we think about small learning environments, what we're creating is, is um, grade seven academy, grade eight academy, grade nine and grade 10 academies. And what I mean by that is instead of having shared staff, which has been kind of the, the, um, the way the middle school and high school is run, is that the middle school students have said very loudly, they want their own identity as a middle school. They don't just want to be sort of like the, the sister to the, to the high school, they want to function. And it's really hard to do that when you have a lot of shared staff. So what we created was um, core academic teachers only working with our seventh grade, core academic teachers only working with our eighth grade, pretty much with our ninth grade and pretty much with our 10th grade. We're gonna evolve into that a little more in high school as our course of studies evolves. Um, but what that means is we have one ELA seventh grade teacher that becomes a content area and grade level expert teaching that one class multiple times a day instead of having to, you know, bounce around from different, con you know, different classes and different grade levels. Those, so in seventh and eighth grade, those two grade bands are going to be supported by one administrator, an assistant principal for the middle school, which really goes deeply in understanding the kids on a very deep level, working very closely with parents, but more importantly, working directly with teachers in the classroom, coaching, helping support the implementation of curriculum, working directly with students who are having um, a challenging time or disrupting learning. So that, I mean, that's really kind of like in the nutshell, what we're talking about. We're talking about breaking down our environments into smaller learning environments at Penbrook, taking our 700 kid um, student school and breaking it down into an L, an L, a lower elementary and an upper elementary where grade bands of students are supported by an assistant principal, a reading, um, a reading teacher, a reading specialist, and either um, and a school adjustment counselor, and the same for the upper elementary. And then in the middle, what we developed, because we've heard so loud and really know that there's a need of supporting our students social, emotionally, and behaviorally in a different way, and wanting to take some of that off of our teachers' plates, we created um, a strong student support center, which is going to be run and managed by our behavior coach at the elementary level. And then we have budgeted two paraprofessionals for the lower and two for the upper to actually go in and support our students who are struggling with social, emotional, and behavioral challenges to the point where we actually hope that we can create, take this reactive kind of culture we have right now of responding to students and being able to create a preventative model and put plans into place and support students and to support teachers. Um, so teaching is interrupted and all kids are able to learn. So here, so this is my favorite slide because I like the picture. Um, 
So we, let's just really talk about the budget right now um, and, and what's going to be different. So we know from the town that it's been functioning in a, what they call a structural deficit for the past couple of years and that they need an override in order to sustain what's happening. So part of what we did with the principals and, create, and the business director and the curriculum director was really create a model of school and sort of backed into the budget. So if we have this model, what is it going to cost to do that? And we had a couple of drivers. We needed something that we knew was going to be sustainable over time, responsible, and, and effective. Um, so we honestly, we started, we didn't start with our budget number from last year. We started with blank spreadsheets. We visioned, we talked about what do we want our school to look like. We landed on, you know, the small learning um, communities, the modules, um, and then honestly backed into the budget that way. We spent three hours in our first meetings together, separate by school. Then we spent two hours really looking at, well, what does this look like staffing wise? What does this look like? Where can people be? Um, and we landed on a budget that's $18,991,220. And that is a $1.1 million ask over last year. Um, and just to, for people to gain a little bit of perspective on where our money goes, 83% of our money, of our budget every year goes to salaries. So currently this year, it's $14,754,139,000 that goes to salaries. In next year's budget, of the $18,9 million, $15,344,242 goes to salaries with $3,646,000. $978 for non-personnel. And what's included in that non-personnel is out of district costs, technology, curriculum adoption, and creating a budget that is actually responsible. So what I learned in my listening, learning, and understanding process was that historically, over the last few years, the district did not fund a budget. The budget was not funded that actually was what the cost represented. I can give you an example that um, um, hold on, I went off script. So I'll get back to that in a second. So honestly, we look really looked at efficiencies and how can we put a budget forward that is responsible. And part of the efficiencies was um, really looking at one of the, the big pieces was looking at our student learning platform. Prior to next year, we the district ran two, um, Google Classroom and Schoology. And by shifting the district to have one learning platform, Google Classroom, we were able to reduce the cost of Schoology. We were able to reduce the cost of our legal line items because we were a, we were very lucky to get a really strong business director who actually also has tens of years of experience running HR. So a lot of the in reasons we needed to have attorney for, our HR director is going to be able to do it. When we were assessing class size, it was also part of the budget. And we tweaked class sizes on this year's average was 17 to 21 students per class and we're shifting it to 19 to 23 students per class next year. Um, there is, and those ranges are within like historic norms within the district for, for Pembroke specifically. We're not expecting any changes in class size at the middle school. And our average high school class size is about 14 students right now. And I think it's even less for electives. And we're bumping the class sizes up to 20. Part of developing a sustainable and responsible budget is also increasing, we had to unfortunately increase line items that had been historically underfunded in the district, oftentimes resulting in a spending freeze in like end of September, early October. And then that, those spending freezes continued throughout the year. The underfunded line items that were really significant included um, maintenance, honestly underfunded by half. Usually the line items were around 60 or $70,000 and spent 160, 170 every year. Day-to-day -day and long-term subs were always significantly underfunded. Um, 
So we 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 wrote a budget that actually funds anticipated expenses and which also helps us grow like project out into the future what is our budget going to look like over time um and i would also rem be really remiss if i didn't sort of share the proverbial elephant in the room part of what's happening in the town because of the um fiscal dilemma is that there's discussion around as i spoke about earlier an override um and what that really means at least from what is explained to me is that the town's revenue over the past couple of years, so the amount of money that the town brings in no longer covers the cost of actually running the town, which is why they need to do an override for Proposition 2.5. The um, Finance Committee and Select Board told all department heads, schools, fire, you know, roads, police, to actually write a budget, including the override number. So that 1.1 million ask above the 2024 budget includes, excuse me, an override number. So we are not gonna know until May 13th is the election as to whether or not the override passes or doesn't pass. If come May 14th and the override doesn't pass, we have been told that we are gonna to have to cut a minimum of 3% out of the 2024 budget. And what that means is $535,000 out of this year's budget and add that to the $1.1 million um, ask for next year, which brings us to a 1.6. There is conversation that it could be more for the schools because if, for example, um, the town decides to tell police you only need to cut 1% or 1.5%, fire, you only need to cut 2%, that extra percentage that they're not cutting could come out of the schools. Um, so I, I think it's very important that we share all of this information. So right now, the budget and the vision that's presented is, is honestly best case scenario. And through all of my... Um, talking and communicating and getting emails and answering questions, there's been three pretty consistent concerns that have come up around the vision, and I wanted to just address it. Um, the first one is moving 22 teachers. So of the nine positions that were being eliminated, we worked diligently, and these were, honestly, these were school-based decisions. I may have been in the room, but I, 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 I did not have the detail on skill set, licensure, all of that. So of the nine positions that were reduced, we were able to limit layoffs to two. And I think two is still a lot. Like there's, this is never an easy or good conversation. But when it came to the 22 moves, it was a result of the deep dive and looking at licensure, looking at seniority. And we have two teachers at the Pembroke School that are not working under a, um, the appropriate license right now. So that meant we had, they, they be, those positions became part of the moves as well. And if you, you take one person and they might be licensed, like we had three openings at Pearly and Pearly is a different license than Penbrook. If we took somebody, we looked for who had licenses at Pearly, who would be a good fit. They may not have been people that have been positions that were being cut, but they got moved to Pearly, which then meant we had to move more people. Um, so it just became an unbelievable like cascade and domino effect. And we had no idea when the conversation started that it was gonna end um, with 22 moves. I have to tell you, I absolutely agree with everybody that 22 teachers being shifted to different positions is a lot. Um, However, moving teachers to a new position is, is common practice. And there's actually there's language in the teacher contract that allows teachers to request it. Um, and I can't say this enough, but the staffing assignments are very fluid, are, are, are gonna change. And we sort of went back and forth. Should we share this information with teachers as early as March? Or should we wait until the contractual deadline, which is I think July 15th, 
But we really landed on the fact that there's so much anxiety and people are so concerned about whether they're going to have a job, what is their job going to look like, that we made the decision to have individual meetings with teachers and, and let them know where, it was, where, they're, where they were landing for next year and also letting them know that this could 100% change. All it takes is one person getting a license in the position that they currently hold or somebody deciding to move you know, somewhere else or, or choosing to go to another district. And then the, the ripple effect happens all over again. I know our teachers are super professionals. When you're hired as an elementary teacher, you're hired as an elementary teacher with a license to teach grades one through six. I am unbelievably confident that teachers are going to be able to um, shift and teach a different grade level. And we're going to really try to help support them. Um, I can tell you when I was a when I was starting out in my career, probably maybe ten years in, I was a social worker, and what in my district it was called a Title I social worker. So I really, honestly, had the best job in the whole world. I was able to see countless kids, families, groups, really on individual therapy. Didn't have to work up worry about third party billing. Just got to see kids grow and change and evolve over four years. Um, I was turning 40 and decided to have another baby and went out on maternity leave and came back and my whole world had been flipped upside down. I was no longer a Title I social worker. They had shifted me to a social worker to service all the students that have social emotional disabilities and be, a, and, and be a special ed social worker. And I'm like, can you really do this? Like just, just, and they should be they, there to me like, well, be happy. We could have eliminated your position or whatever. Um, so I can tell you, I was shocked. I was like, oh, this is gonna be really uncomfortable. But I can also tell you, had that not ever happened, I probably wouldn't be sitting in the position I am today. It absolutely changed the trajectory of my career. Um, and I'm not saying that's going to happen to everybody. I can just sympathize with how hard it is to all of a sudden realize, oh, what I thought I knew isn't anymore. Um, we are working to alleviate some of the trepidation and the fear for people and teachers. And um, we've tossed around ideas. How can we help support our teachers? And we landed, we landed on ideas that I don't know if they're good ideas. We want to actually create a working group with teachers who are being affected by the moves, but we've thrown out the idea of um, could we free teachers up this year to actually go and shadow people that are in the positions they're going to have next year. Like, what would that look like? What would that feel like? Would teachers want a peer mentor that we could connect them with in order to have somebody to just, you know, call a friend? What is this? What are we doing? Can you teach me about this? And, and formalize it so it doesn't feel like um, you're just knocking on people's doors. Would it be helpful if we had monetary compensation for teachers to come in this summer and redo their rooms and reset up their new space? And what is it can we do to help? Um, we are open and to, to, to creating any sort of plan or system to help teachers feel more comfortable walking into school next year. Um, so we're gonna ask people if they wanna be involved in a working group to create a model moving forward that can help them. Um, another piece of the puzzle is, you know, it feels like there's a, a really clear divide. The, the union has their perspective. School administration has their perspective. The community has, you know, per perspectives of both. And I really want to be able to, how do we move things forward? So as early as this morning, um, myself and uh, Mike Cassidy, the business director, met with two of the union members that are on the executive board and really just started talking about what can we do to try to um, get us on the same page, let the community know that we're really working together. So we're, we're started a plan on how to get teacher voice at the table immediately, um, specifically around some of the moves and what could that look like. I have a meeting with somebody that could potentially come in and help us facilitate a really global community-wide strategic planning process, which could be about what, what, what do we want collectively our school to look at, to look like in the future? Um, what do we want our graduates to come out of school with? Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. Um, 
I know this was really broad strokes. Again, happy to share links, conversations, anything that I can do to help people um, feel more comfortable of where we're at. Um, and at this point, I think we can just open it up to questions. Sure. Um, so lots of similar themes through some of the questions. So I'm gonna try to uh, group them as best I can. Um, someone was looking for a little bit of clarification um, when you mentioned that teachers were interested in more student accountability and just trying to understand what you meant by that statement. Sure. Sure. Um, I think that has a lot to do with, um, it probably has to do a lot with the change in the discipline law that comes down from the state level where we are now as educators, the last resort legally allowed to us is suspension, which used to be in the past, almost sometimes a first resort. There's just so much research that shows it actually damages kids. We lose kids. They end up not graduating from high school. Um, so where I think this lands is that in Georgetown, they talk about um, having put in some um, PBIS, positive behavior intervention and support strategies. And I think as a result of that, teachers and families sometimes feel that there's actually not consequences for students who don't make all the great choices all the time. So I really think that was the flavor. It was around accountability on students who make negative behavior choices. Um, and several questions in relation to how teachers will be supported with new curriculum, particularly at Pembroke, um, as we start that with the new year, in addition to moving to new grades. Sure. Um, super excited to say that we're actually um, working on finalizing some professional development that could actually happen the end of this school year with with financial compensation. And we've recreated, we redid the master professional development calendar with, and really shifted to making sure that we, at a minimum, we have a half day professional development every month to work directly with student, to work with teachers on um, curriculum and teaching practices. So there, there we're already sort of mapped out what is that gonna look like with um, the early literacy vendor and how are we gonna make sure? The other piece of it is being able to have time with teachers on a weekly basis to help them plan and really dig into the curriculum and then be able to look at student work and say, oh, are the students progressing? Do we need to reteach something? Like what, like where is, what is the learning and what does it look like? And that actually will then inform the planning. So, you know, regular common planning times during the week, um, significant deep dives on a monthly basis. And we could even use part of the um, teacher faculty meeting time, potentially if, if so needed. All right, perfect. Um, a few questions related to why teachers were not consulted prior to being transferred or having a voice in, um, in that process. Sure. It, honestly, this time it was just an unbelievably complicated situation. Like I said, we had no idea we were going to end up with 22 moves. And there was a couple of things. Um, it was really, really complicated because of licensure. And there was just a, like on, I can honestly tell you on a very personal level, there was a fear that if we we opened this up for input and then if we weren't allowed to give the teachers like their first choice or exactly what they wanted, that then there would be, there would just be conversation around, well, they asked us, but they didn't listen. So it was really about the complication of figuring out where are the best spots for people to be. And honestly, I'm going to say this again, there is a very good chance things are going to move and having teacher voice when it's not so complicated is gonna be a much easier process. Perfect. Um, several questions in relation to um, what work there is planned to help support and rebuild the morale in the schools among the teachers and staff. I think that has to be a collaborative conversation with administrators, teachers, union, um, we are working, you know, 
that's always on the forefront of what we need, but no one person or one strategy is going to improve morale. It's got to, we have to work together. Um, several questions in relation to if the override does not go through, um, what does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah, I, I don't have that answer. I was asked the same question at the finance committee and I said, we're, we're just taking a breath right now. We need to really um, kind of honestly catch our breath, try to get things a little bit hopefully settled down and be able to move forward together so we can help support the community to understand the importance of the override. Um, a couple of questions, one in clarification. Were there any layoffs at Pembroke? Were there any teachers laid off at Pembroke? No. Um, and there were a few questions in relation to um, the shift in adding, you know, something to our planning time and what planning time is going to look like um, if we are taking that up with trying to learn new curriculum. I don't know if we have an answer to that yet, but um, several questions in relation to that. So the planning time would be to actually dive deeper in to like a specific piece of the curriculum, like which, which module, which lesson is going to be taught this week or tomorrow to really be able to to dig in what is the, the most important learning from this lesson? How are we going to know the kids learned it? Where do we think the kids might get tripped up so we can actually sort of pre-teach a piece of it? And then how are we collecting data at the end of the lesson to know if the students learned it or not? I, I don't know if I, I wasn't really sure your your question, but. Um, yeah, there, it's kind of a wonky question, but um, I think unless you're in their planning time, maybe it's hard to understand well, that's the hope is that there's going to where um, that's one of the reasons there's more administration. So administration can help lead the the planning time with a goal that we can start building teacher leaders on each team to actually lead some of this work. Okay. Um, a question about the special education audit um, or program evaluation. Are the results of that going to be shared publicly? Yeah, um, I think I have a meeting either the end of this week or early next week with the people who conducted the audit. And for an extra $500, they will actually <laughs> present it to the school committee. And I honestly think it probably will make the most sense to have the um, people who conducted it to actually present the results. I have, we, I mean, I think this is a good point because I haven't mentioned special ed other than that it's a worry for a lot of people. We did not touch special ed spending on any level. We didn't add to it or detract from it in the budget because I really want to see where we land with the audit. In addition to, we do not have a director of student support services right now. Um, we have an interim two day a week very talented, very gifted. And I, I ask her every day if she would just stay for a year and help us get settled. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of unknowns yet in special ed. And I think it would just be very irresponsible to make any moves budget wise or staffing wise until we have um, an assessment and recommendations. Okay. Um, a few questions around if the plan includes hiring additional paraprofessionals um, to help support the students in the classroom, as some of them have a heavy caseload currently. Um, so when we talk about, we have different levels of paraprofessionals. So we have special, um, we have a paraprofessional in every one of our kindergarten classrooms and they're to support the whole class. Then we have paraprofessionals that um, are called instructional paraprofessionals, and they are really identified to support specific um, students that have special needs, whether it's students one-on-one, -on -one, two on one, or you know, whatever the the team deems needed for the student. Um, so we have no vision of just hiring more paraprofessionals, but what we have done is really create the, as I spoke about the um, student support model, especially at the secondary, I mean, at the elementary level, where we're adding four additional paraprofessionals really to support all the kids in those grades. 
in really truly a preventative model. Like, do kids need to take a walk? Do they have a plan that needs to be put into place? What can we look at data and see when kids, you know, certain students might start bubbling up? How can we intervene before that happens? Really taking the reactive model that we're, we're struggling with right now and really turn it on its head and have a, a preventative model, which will actually decrease student who needs something more. When you think about a student and their behavior, this behavior is all about them trying to communicate something, which they just can't seem to do in uh, an adaptive, healthy way. So they have maladaptive coping skills. We need to help them grow and develop healthier coping skills. And that's when prevention model works. Um, similar to this line of thought is um, what sort of incentives for hiring new paras or um, training and um, professional development will we be offering for paras? Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, so I meet with the paraprofessional union every, once, a, once a month. And the first one that came out was it really became so clear to me that con collectively that they feel pretty undervalued and um, really not respected because they've never been prioritized from their perspective on training. So I have reached out to the Center for Educational um, Collaborative, I don't know, CES out in Western Mass. And we have already given them our professional development calendar and they have set aside every day, every half day and time before school starts to run an ongoing professional development series for our paraprofessionals. They, the lat, where we landed so far is she sent me the list of all the different offerings they have for professional development. And now the, the GISA union is getting people together to, to create a working group on what do they want it to look like? Where do they want to start? What is the, what is the professional development they feel they need specifically for Georgetown? Um, and we are getting close to signing the contract but really specific. I also strongly believe that our paraprofessionals, um, if they're helping with instruction, they need to be in the instructional professional development as well. If we're bringing in a new literacy curriculum, they need to know what that is. They need to know what you know all of the resources are and how to support our kids as well. So it's gonna to have to be a balance for some of our paraprofessionals to be able to really help with the instruction as well as build their skill set um, across all of their needs of students. Okay. Um, we have a few questions that have come through in regards to your estimation of a timeline for when we will see these changes benefit the district as a whole. We are putting significant data systems in the place to be able to collect what I call indicator data along the way. But institutional change takes about three to five years before we're going to see huge um, data jumps, but we're going to be able to track it along the way. Every intervention, every piece of the puzzle that we're putting into place, we're going to be able to know if it's having the, the warranted effect. And if not, reassess and tweak. Um, that's what data-driven instruction is, data-driven leadership is. But up until now, and we're not even quite there yet, we just haven't had the data systems to collect the data that we need in order to know where we are. Okay. Um, there are a few questions related to, um, you know, the tight staffing in some of our programs, um, causing administrators to have to be involved directly in the classroom and how they are going to be able to support um, new initiatives like curriculum when they are engaged sometimes one-on-one -on -one with, with students. Yeah, I mean, that goes back to really looking at our special ed programming and staffing for our special ed programming and not just and what is our programming, what is the milieu like, what are our kids need, really thinking about it absolutely holistically. Okay. And um, how many new curriculums are there going to be at Pembroke? In um, K to five, one, they're all gonna have um, a literacy, a new literacy curriculum. And the six, sixth grade team, which functions more as a middle school team, each sixth grade teacher teaches one content area. 
Um, they will have the, so the English teacher will have the new literacy curriculum. We're hoping to be able to bring in a new um, secondary math curriculum, which would be from grade six to L pre-calc, I think. Math, math curriculums are a little wonkier. Um, and we are actually hoping to be able to bring in um, science curriculum. But again, that would be one new curriculum per teacher. No teacher is expected to, to teach more than one new curriculum. Okay. Um, there was a question in relation to your comment about um, changes at Purley led to the domino effect of moving teachers. Um, did we consider cutting classrooms at Purley as opposed to in other locations in the district? Um, so Purley is driven, it's a integrated preschool model that is driven by IDEA, which is our federal laws around special education. So we are mandated, as long as we have an integrated preschool, to service whatever child that has special ed needs in our pre-K. And, and the other piece of that is there's ratio, the only certain amount of students that have special ed needs versus students that don't have special ed needs can be in a classroom. So we can't cut classes, classrooms, um, and overload another classroom with, with too many students that might have special ed needs. So cutting classrooms there um, wasn't even a, a possibility because the needs from the community and the community speaks very loudly that they love Pearly. It's an absolute um, gem in the community and parents are very happy with what's happening. What has changed at Pearly, and we've talked about this a lot of times, when I came in back in July, um, I, I quickly realized on top of some of the licensure issues for administration and teachers, Pearly wasn't, honestly, there was very few people licensed at Pearly as um, under DESE certification. We had one teacher that was licensed. Um, and we, the district had been thinking about shifting the whole preschool to the EEC model, which believe it or not, is not a public school model. And had the decision been moved forward, it does, it has a lower threshold for certifying teachers. And under that model, they're not, they would not have been in the CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, which means you wouldn't have had to pay them as much as certified Department of Ed teachers. The flip side of that is our building is really old. There is a very good chance EEC would have come in and never certified our building. And it could have cost millions and millions of dollars to get it up to the standard that EEC would have wanted. In addition, um, the district would lose all the chapter at chapter 70 funding for the entire population of Pearly Preschool. And we're, we, we're governed by the Department of Ed it only made sense to move us back into the to the Department of Ed, which meant we had a window of time and we were very honest. I and Shannon and I met with the big wigs at the Department of Ed of like, this is where we are right now. We have very few licensed teachers working with our kids. We have a plan. This is what we're thinking and this is where we're going. So being able to shift teachers um, due to the, the position reductions that are licensed and, and um, some of them have experience in teaching pre-K was just really a natural fit in order to keep the uh, pearly up and running and flying and functioning at a very high level for kids and keeping teachers employed. Okay. Um, several questions looking for clarification in regards to um, the statement that there were no layoffs at Pembroke. Um, in regards to, I believe, a fourth grade teacher? Um, as far as I know, there was no non-renewal letters given at, at Penbrook at all. I think there was one teacher that was, um, there was confusion around a, a resignation versus a non-renewal. Okay. But on the day in question, no, but no letters were given. Okay. As far as I know, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll come out publicly and say I'm wrong, but that's really what I think. Okay. Um, and then 
there were a few questions in regards to any electives in the middle high school that may be um, cut from the oh, program. Sure, I had that on my slide and didn't speak to it. I'm sorry. Um, at this point, there's been absolutely no expectation of sweeping cuts of electives at the high school. Where we are, in the, first of all, I also want to say we are not cutting drama. I was given incorrect information when we were talking about how many English teachers we needed. I was never informed that drama lived in English. Um, and our drama teacher, who is actually an English teacher, really is actually a drama teacher because she teaches three classes in drama and two teaches in English, and she is certified in both, so it's not a certification issue. Um, but that was also one of the reasons why we reinstated what the second English teacher that was potentially going to be laid off. Um, the, the kids right now, all the students right now are doing their class registration and request forms. So once we have all of those in place, we're going to be able to see who, which kids wanted what and which classes we can offer, which is really the typical process at the high school. They have so many class offerings, but you can't offer all the classes if only kids sign up, if only one or two kids sign up for a class. So we're just going to really land on um, what's that going to look like. The other piece of, of information around electives at the high school is English 12. Um, right now, they have a whole slew of offerings of English elective half-year classes that count as a graduation requirement. They also have an honors um, lit class and they have an AP class. We have 63 children projected for our senior class next year. Um, so we really need to figure out what does English 12 look like kind of moving forward, not cutting the AP, not necessarily cutting the honors class, but is there a way to take all these semester um, elective classes like journalism, creative writing, um, writing and film, and actually make it a year long class that's like have the modules by quarter and um, just be able to you know, really strive to have close to 20 students in a class. Okay. Um, there was some clarification needed around the statement that no teacher will be expected to teach more than one new curriculum. However, several teachers will be moving to new grades. So wouldn't they in fact, wouldn't they be teaching, um, a lot of them be teaching new curriculum next year? So I think it's how you define curriculum. When you look at uh, a new, any curriculum, you buy a curriculum for a grade span. And it really is the same curriculum and the same teacher moves, the same way you set up your classroom, the way you instruct, they, but each each grade level will have different, you're targeting different standards. So different content, but not necessarily different curriculum. So yes, I think, I mean, I it's kind of splitting hairs. Um, but if you were a second grade teacher teaching the math curriculum and you go to third grade, it's gonna be very, very familiar with just a, a focus on the third grade standards versus the second grade standards. Okay. Um, a few questions looking for clarification on, um, and I, I believe you did mention this earlier, but just to reiterate who, was involved in making the decisions around which teachers were transferred to um, different grades? The biggest lift on that was Penbrook, and that was really the, the grade level. I mean, the, the, the leadership team at Penbrook, the system principal, special ed coordinator, and the principal. Um, I think that there's some questions in relation to, um, you know, how we could perhaps improve that process so that we don't miss things such as drama, um, you know, when we're having these conversations, if there was a better system for, for making these types of moves, we consider. I have questions, having more different people at the table, as simple as that, um, absolutely. And I'm all for thinking about how we do this next year. Um, I'm not gonna sit here and defend myself, but I'm a first year superintendent that was really in a position that really felt like a chokehold between negotiations and an override and the the pressure of the status quo not being okay and really needing to, to put something together um, 
that I 100% stand behind as a model and developmentally appropriate for kids and unbelievable support for teachers. Um, but if we can think about how this goes moving forward, and I think the strategic planning process will be a huge part of that, getting many, many more voices at the table around what do we want Georgetown Public Schools to be, grow into over the next five years, I think will really help if we have a map that we're working together. Um, question in regards to when will parents be uh, made aware of what grades teachers will be teaching next year? Um, I'm not sure what Pembroke's process is in terms of how they do class assignments or notify teachers. I have not heard that there'd be any change in it, but I would reach out to um, the admin team at Pembroke and ask them. That wouldn't come from central office. All right, and we are almost running out of time. So um, take another couple of questions. Um, just a question around special education caseloads and how we are going to address um, the size and overwhelming size of those caseloads currently. Yeah, I, th I think that's a piece of the puzzle that we need to really figure out what is special ed going to look like moving forward. And what, what does case size mean? I mean, there's with the new IEP coming out, um, things are just fundamentally going to change anyway. And I, I, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know where we're going to land with that. But I think having our special educators at the table to be part of the, the modeling plan is really important. OK. And then several, this will probably be the last one we have time for, um, several questions in regards to the specific move between a third grade teacher and a fifth grade teacher, and what was the um, thought process there? Yeah, I wasn't part of those. I don't have that answer. You'd have to reach out to the principal and his team. Okay. Um, what are you thinking? It's seven thirty-one. Um, yeah, I think if you can capture, you know, okay. what's in the chat, we. I just want to be respectful of everybody's time, um, and I can. Um, do a, a response or okay. we'll, we'll get back. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to put out there that we are going to um, make sure that we can go through all these questions later. There were several coming through all at one time. Um, so we wanna make sure that, you know, we get an opportunity to have those questions answered. So we're gonna save the chat so that we can do that um, in time. Uh, one question that has popped up a few times is why do so much in year one as opposed to um, a three to five year plan? Um, I, I Honestly, there's lots of moving parts. Some of affects everybody, some affects a few people. It's really about honestly, a sense of urgency, a sense of timeliness in terms of what is it going to, what is it going to cost to fund the schools moving into the future? And that's what this foundational budget was really about, not just this year, but is it sustainable um, over time? And what does that look like? And really believing that our staff are up to the challenge and our kids, you know, they're only in first grade once, they're only in second grade once, and hopefully only in ninth and 10th grade once. Um, and we need to make sure they're prepared to be the amazing contributing adults that we want them to be. So thank you. And just so everybody else knows, we this is the first of, I think there's three more scheduled um, this week. So I will probably wait and answer questions that weren't answered um, and just wait and see where it all falls by the end of the um, Friday afternoon after the, the last forum. But I appreciate everybody coming. I appreciate everybody's passion. Um, and thank you. Um, Paul and Shannon, do you want to stay on for a minute after yep. people log out?